Well, thank you so much for allowing me to present. As I, um, you said, my name is Erin Brewer. I represent Partners for Ethical Care. And we have members um, all over the world, including in New Zealand. Um, one of our members actually asked me to present on, on um, behalf of New Zealand children primarily who are suffering from gender dysphoria. One of the things that I want to address is there's a lot of confusion right now about conversion therapy and what that term is. Conversion therapy is a politicized, politicized term. It's an umbrella term. And a lot of people, when they hear it, they think about shock therapy. They think about abuse. They think about praying away the gay. That's what is um, thought of when people talk about conversion therapy. Unfortunately, legislative efforts around the world are actually eliminating talk therapy that can help children resolve gender dysphoria, um, difficult feelings that are that are caused as a result of gender dysphoria. And so I want to make it clear that the reason that this is a contentious issue isn't because um, Partners for Ethical Care supports in any way abusing children, praying away the gay, praying away a transgender identity or shock therapy. Those are all heinous um, approaches to a very difficult situation for child for children. But the, the use of the term conversion therapy also applies to talk therapy, and it can scare therapists away from working with children like me who had a trans identity as a child. And I want to um, just outline for you what the treatment options are for children who are not allowed to pursue treatment through talk therapy. So a child like me who suffered from gender dysphoria, who has a trans identity, instead of being allowed to pursue treatment to identify the underlying causes of that transgender identity, now gets put on puberty blockers, which um, basically retard their growth and development. Then they're put on cross-sex hormones, which permanently sterilize them. Often they're encouraged to get their breasts amputated. And if they're a boy, they're castrated. If they're physically castrated if they're not already chemically castrated from the puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones. This is the treatment path available to children like I was, rather than getting help to resolve the underlying issues that cause the gender dysphoria. Oftentimes, one of those underlying issues is a child who has internalized homophobia and is a gay child or a child who comes from home that is homophobic. So instead of praying away the gay now, we are transing away the gay, and that is unconscionable. Doing this, um, transing a child results in a negative self-worth because what you're telling a child is that they are so inherently flawed that the only way that they can um, exist in the world, that they can survive themselves, is to disassociate, to basically commit suicide within themselves and become a different person. This is a psychiatric condition called dissociation that therapists try to mitigate. But in this case, children are being encouraged to dissociate from themselves, to kill off who they are and to become someone else because if they have found themselves so difficult to live with. Having therapists and other mental health professionals and doctors and parents and teachers affirm this is incredibly dangerous. It damages that child's self-esteem to the core. They're told their authentic self is not okay. And the only way they can be authentic and appropriate is to become somebody totally different, somebody totally new. Um, this increases suicidal ideations because what happens is as these children engage in these um, treatments, these incredibly dangerous experimental treatments, and then they realize they still have the same problems, only they've damaged their body that was healthy to start out with, but after all these interventions now has long-term um, side effects and complications. Um, in addition, they're given the message, they're inherently flawed and no child should be given that message. Children should not allowed to um, process their underlying cause of this gender dysphoria or their transgender identity. Oftentimes, these are children who are simply gender non-conforming. And instead of being accepted as gender non-conforming, they're told that because they don't adhere to regressive gender stereotypes, that they're actually the opposite sex. That's a ridiculous thing to suggest to a kid and incredibly dangerous when we're trying to teach kids that they don't have to adhere to regressive gender stereotypes. Oftentimes, a transgender identity is a social contagion as, as kids watch their peers become popular and affirmed, 
and celebrated for coming out with a trans identity. This is documented by Lisa Lippman, and we know that this happens in other situations, and it happens in with trans identities. Oftentimes, puberty alone is enough to trigger a trans identity as a child is uncomfortable with how their, their body is changing, and they want to stop that because they don't know how to deal with it. These are children who need support, not told that they're inherently flawed. And finally, many of these children are suffering because of sexual assault. And that is what caused my transgender identity. I was sexually assaulted brutally when I was in kindergarten. And as a result, I adopted a trans identity because I thought it was because I was a girl that I was sexually assaulted. So I thought becoming a boy would be safe. If I were a child today in many countries where they're banning conversion therapy, I would not have gotten the help that I needed. I would have been told that I was inherently flawed and that I had to become a different person in order to survive. I did get help, what would now be considered conversion therapy by many people. And thankfully my school psychologist um, at, didn't affirm me and accepted that I had some deep seated issues. She didn't allow me to be called the name I wanted to be called. She didn't let me go into the boys' bathrooms. She didn't call me by the pronouns I wanted her to call me by. And I'm so thankful for that because if she had, I would not be the woman that I am today who has accepted the fact that the sexual assault was not my fault. Instead, she, she taught me how to be proud of being a female. She exposed me to strong women. She put me in a communication group to help me to communicate with other children and adults. And she put me in activities with other girls. All of these things can be considered conversion therapy now under this new huge umbrella of conversion therapy. Therapy ban would have put me at risk. Um, it would have denied me the opportunity to process the trauma that caused my transgender identity in the first place. Imagine denying a child the opportunity to resolve the trauma of a sexual assault and instead to tell that child the only way they're ever going to survive what happened is to become the opposite sex, to damage their healthy body with puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and surgeries. In addition, it would have reinforced the shame and self-hatred that I had for myself. This is horrific. I hear from detransitioner after detransitioner who is filled with betrayal because she had adults in her life that told her that that shame and self-hatred that she had was reasonable and that becoming the opposite sex was the only solution. In addition, these children are exposed to potential additional sexual assaults as they go into the opposite sex bathrooms. I think of myself as a little girl. If I had been affirmed as a boy and told that I was indeed a boy, if I had gone into the public bathrooms, if I'd gone into showers, if I'd gone into other spaces where I was a little girl with adult men, that would have increased the chance that I was re-traumatized with the sexual assault. We are putting vulnerable children at risk by not allowing them to access appropriate mental health services. If children are not permitted to explore the underlying issues of their gender dysphoria, the only treatment option is medical transition. And Sweden recently came out and said that they're pulling back on puberty blockers and cross-sex hormones because they see the damage that these interventions are causing. Banning therapy choice condemns at-risk youth to experimental and unproven hormonal and surgical interventions, which permanently medicalize a child for a condition that is overwhelmingly resolved through in adulthood if they're allowed to naturally progress through childhood. Imagine medicalizing a child for life because of I'm these so interventions. Sorry, um, sorry um, uh, Erin, but we have a couple of questions and we're sure. nearly at the end of your 10 minutes. So I might just sure. uh, stop you there if that's possible. Uh, mm -hmm. I've got a question from Nicole McKay. Mm -hmm. Hi, Erin. Hey, thank you very much for coming here and for sharing your story with us as well and the insights that you have. I understand what you're talking about, the difference between talk therapy and uh, the conversion therapy that practices that we're looking to ban. And, um, and I think that there does need to be talk therapy as well. I'm just wondering, um, and I'm sorry because I actually left a little bit through your submission, so you may have covered it. My apologies if I did miss it. But what are your thoughts on parents uh, being able to be a part of a talk therapy process with their children uh, in order to not so much uh, turn them away from uh, what they are wanting to do, but rather be able to open up some of those bigger options for them to have discussions 
uh, and perhaps even go and seek therapeutic help afterwards. What are your thoughts on the parent's role is, I guess, what I'm, what I'm asking? Well, and I think that's a really good question. Um, and a lot of it depends on what kind of therapy is allowed and what kind of therapy therapists feel safe doing. We have seen over and over again that when these therapy bans are introduced, therapists are afraid to address any underlying issues that might be a result um, that might have caused a transgender identity, including autism, including internalized homophobia, in turn, including parents who are homophobic. And so if you have a therapist who feels perfectly confident that they're not going to be prosecuted for conversion therapy and having a parent in there to help understand what these underlying issues are for the gender identity confusion that a child has, I think it's a really good idea to have the parent involved. However, if you enact these laws and therapists feel that they have to affirm that child, and the only option is to try and convert the parents into believing that their child is actually transgender, I think it's incredibly dangerous. I talk to parents every day through my organization who are being pressured by doctors and therapists to accept that their son or daughter that they have is actually the opposite sex. When the parent knows that this child is not born transgender, that something happened, that either the child is autistic and struggling at school, or they've been sexually abused, or they're struggling because of internalized homophobia. And they know that. And so they don't feel like it's at all appropriate to affirm this child. And in a lot of cases, they're being pressured to, they're being told they're transphobic if they don't, they're being told they're bigots. And that's what these kind of therapy bans do when they include gender identity. It's incredibly dangerous um, for these kids who are struggling with all these issues, especially when we know that over 90% of children who have gender identity issues will outgrow them if they're allowed to naturally progress through childhood. And instead we're medicalizing them and telling, affirming that and putting them on the pathway towards lifelong medicalization. Thank you very much. I've got one final question from Louisa Wall. Uh, Tenakwe Erin, um, thank you for your submission. And um, I want to acknowledge the disclosure uh, and the vulnerability you've placed yourself in. Um, I just have a question actually about your credentials, if you don't mind. Um, in New Zealand, uh, we're really clear that health practitioners who are registered and accredited with their professional body will have scope to practice uh, within a scope of practice that their health uh, professional body deems as safe and will do no harm to the patients or the clients they, they choose to serve. So just for our information, what is your qualification? What is your accreditation and, and registration? Uh, and, and I'm very interested in the scope of practice that you operate under. Right. I'm actually, um, I'm not a mental health practitioner. I have a PhD in education. Um, I have been a lifelong educator. Um, part of my uh, interest in this um, is because of my childhood experience and because of the conversion therapy ban that was introduced in the state where I live that would have banned the therapist that I had when I was in elementary school from helping me to resolve the underlying issues that caused me to disassociate from myself and identify as a boy. And that's how I got involved with this. Since I started to get involved with this, I have had detransitioners reach out to me um, by the dozens who have had similar experiences and additionally parents who have reached out because they are so lost and they don't know where to turn because these therapy bans have um, made it so that they don't have a therapeutic option for kids who really do need appropriate mental health services. Um, my organization, Partners for Ethical Care, formed specifically to push back against medicalizing children who have gender identity issues. So just finally, and it is personal, but were you were diagnosed with gender dysphoria? Is I, was I was diagnosed. Um, they, that actually wasn't a diagnosis when I was a child. So I'm aging myself a bit. Um, that wasn't a term. Um, it hadn't come out in the DSM-5 yet. I was given a diagnosis of a dissociative disorder um, because of the um, insistence that I had that I was a boy. Um, this wasn't um, me pretending to be a boy. This wasn't me um, being a tomboy. This was a, a deep-seated belief that I had that I actually was a boy. And um, 
it was a dissociative process. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with what dissociation is, um, but it's when you know something happens and it's a coping mechanism and it's actually a really creative coping mechanism, but it's also not um, a, a sustainable one. And so having that intervention is so important. And again, the detransitioners I talk to, their stories are so similar to mine. They have such, um, you know, we all resonate with such similar stories. And um, it's because uh, our dissociation, um, in my case, my dissociation was not affirmed and I was given help and I was allowed to um, first manage and then resolve my underlying issues with the help of a lot of therapy. The children today are affirmed and they're told immediately that they are in fact a boy if they believe they're a boy, if they have that dissociative process going on, they're not being given appropriate mental oh, health thank services. You. And I'm sorry, we're going to have to Again, it's because gone, therapists we're, we're are so time, afraid but, to pursue um, therapy. We've gone way over time. Can I just check whereabouts are you, you calling in from? I am calling in from um, Logan, Utah, Northern Utah in the United States. In Utah. Well, thank you yeah, for joining us. And thank us. you so much for allowing me the opportunity to share. I hope that you'll consider um, my concerns.